I just want to sell out for you and praise you this morning. You know, I just I challenge you to come in here with that attitude to praise God Almighty. And as we sing, just say, God, I'm yours. Here I am. I want to worship you this morning. As we sing, sing it to the Lord.
here need you so badly today and I ask you to settle down over this place with your Holy Spirit like never before Lord there are people that need to be ministered to today they need to be restored they need to be healed they need to be renewed they need to have their joy put back into place and Lord there may be somebody here that's at the bottom of their hope so I'm asking you to touch each and every one of us right where we're at. Lord, you know that we're all different, but yet we're the same. We are all your children, your heirs. So Lord, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace that you sent to this earth through your son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. And Lord, we're so thankful he sits at your right hand now, interceding for each and every one of us. He's looking at us as if we'd never sinned. We're justified, holy, and righteous. So, Lord, thank you for touching us, for loving us, for blessing us with your saving and healing grace through your Son, Jesus. And it's in his precious, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love on somebody before you sit down. precious young gal over here that had a birthday this week. Was it yesterday? Friday. Friday. 66 years young. Bless the Lord. Will you stand up, sweetheart? We're going to sing to you this morning. And it's Judy, right? 66 years old. You say 66 years young. Okay? All right, sweetheart. Let's let's sing to Judy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Judy. Happy birthday to you. Now we've got this tradition, God's blessing. God's blessings to you. God's blessings to you, God's blessings dear Judy, God's blessings to you. Yay. Yay. You're welcome, so much. Well, I want us to, I want us to pay attention to our, our screen up here. Uh, we give a lot of announcements on Sunday mornings, and they take a lot of time. And I know some of us get here late once in a while and everything, but watch. Uh, they go to a lot of a lot of work to put our, our uh, announcements up here, and they scroll. Uh, Melissa very soon is going to have these things scrolling on our website constantly. 
so you'll be able to go to the web and, and, and catch up on everything that's going on. Uh, we've got a Jason Gray concert that's going to be up here at South Milford, and uh, it's going to be the 7th at 7 o'clock, and we can buy a block of tickets, and if we do, they're $10 a piece. Uh, he's really a good uh, Christian artist, and uh, we're fortunate to have him this close up at South Milford. So if any of you would like to go and, and hear that, or Stroh, I said South Milford, didn't I? I'm sorry. There you go. You got to go out there and look and make sure you're going to do it right. But uh, we'd love to just take a bunch of us and go up there and support that. It's going to be a really good thing. Uh, Winter Jam is going to be March 1st, and that's, uh, that's geared towards our young people. But oh my gosh, anybody can get blessed going there. There's band after band after band. And we've gone down there and stood in line for three, four hours in the last several years and got really bad seats. So we decided to try something this year, and we'll see how it works. We can buy blocks of uh, tickets there, too, uh, uh, 10 tickets, and they're $30 each. And we don't want any kids that want to go uh, not be able to go because they can't afford it. So we'll have some scholarships and everything, but we'll be able to go down there and get in and get good seats. And I think they'll even be able to talk to some of the band members. So uh, there's a sign-up sheet out there for that too. So get, get signed up if you want to go. Uh, that's going to be March 1st. And be prepared to get home late because they rock and roll down there. Y'all need to pay attention to the scrolling announcement. <laughs> this is God telling you not to listen to me to pay attention to right there. I don't know where I got March 1st. When is it? Well, I was going to announce that too. <laughs> Melissa, why don't you come up here and get me? <laughs> Winter Jam, 19th. You have to sign up by March 1st, so we can do oh, a lot of tickets. Okay. Yeah, right. you are, you are. <laughs> now I know why it's so cold in here, because she's got all these snowy mountains <laughs> that yeah. hit me. This week is Winter Wonderland for our kids. I'm sure many of you have noticed that the kids make up a very large portion of our congregation. Actually, over one-third now of our um, body is children. So That's we're awesome. going to invest in them this week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So um, if your kids are signed up, bring them a little before 6 o'clock to get them registered. They get a backpack and lots of fun goodie things to do throughout the evening. And then Friday night is open to everybody. You can bring neighbor kids, um, you know, bring your kids that aren't coming to Winter Wonderland. The whole family come. We're going to have this all set, set up in a carnival with snow cones and popcorn and just a good time. We'll open and worship, and so we hope that you can come out. See so if you have any questions. What kind of help we need, yeah? We, we doing pretty good on that? good, but if you want to help, see me. Sure. I have things you can do. We can always do it. Oh, Love to have you we help have about out. 75 kids we're expecting, so. yeah. And we've been uh, doing our attendance books, and what I'd like to remind you to do is start it in the front row and then pass it back and take a, and a book straight back in each each section and sign it. Make sure it gets to the back. And put all your information in there. For some of you that are new and would like to be on our email list, uh, there's a, a little uh, form in there. You can fill it out with your information and we'll get you on the email list. And then there's a fam jam meeting after church and they're going to have pizza. And they're going to do it back in the youth room. And uh, that's a really neat... Uh, thing that's been birthed in, uh, is this the second or third year? Third year. Third year for that, and it's over to Alabama, to Noble County Saddle Club, and we have band after band playing. Um, it's free, and you can come and camp or do whatever. The Christian Motorcycle Association comes, and it's just really a cool time. Then we have a church service over there. And, and they're just people come from all over that county area here. And it's just a really neat thing that's been started. 
and uh, it works out really good. And, and they're going to have that meeting today if I if I announced it right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All the time. That is awesome. Well, we'll a lot, most of us know that we've been in Acts for a long time. And uh, last week, those of us that ventured out, um, we talked about prayer and how important prayer is, uh, not only in our individual lives, but as a corporate body, as a church. And we saw Peter, uh, Herod, he got this nasty attitude, and we're going to talk about him today. And he kills James. Uh, we talked about, about uh, the sword and, and how they beheaded James. Uh, John the Baptist was beheaded, and we related that through Ishmael and, and the descendants and how that is responsible <coughs> even yet today for the beheadings that are going on. It's the same thing going on, a different bunch doing it. That curse was given to Ishmael and his descendants, and it says they'll fight like wild donkeys with their brothers until the end of time. And that's where this ISIS, Al-Qaeda, all this thing is coming from. We talked about that. And it's, it's still going on yet today. But church prayer is important. They, it says they earnestly pray. And we talked about the church earnestly praying, constantly praying. Oh, is there power in numbers, especially when it comes to prayer. And when we come together as a corporate body, it is so powerful when we pray. That's why I love Destiny Family and Faith's prayer chain. When we get that out, uh, it, things happen. It was awesome. Uh, it carries... Uh, mom was in a six car pile up yesterday and they came and, and told me and asked me to put her in a prayer chain and I just sat here with a piece over me and I thought she's covered and, and I just sat there and prayed for her myself when, when uh, Rachel came and told me and then after a while I went and got on the prayer chain and here uh, she's dismissed and doing really good I, she's got some cuts and bruises but the power of prayer, they're from a praying church over there. And there's just a sense and a comfort in knowing that when you're really close to God, prayer changes things. And you know, we expect, we talked about when bad things happen to good people, uh, even when we pray as a corporate body, there are some bad things that happen to bad people. But do we not know that God has us covered and even though we may lose physically on this earth, we win eternally forever and ever. So that prayer is not in vain. <coughs> they had little faith their prayer would work, and, and we talked about that. Here they pray. Uh, uh, God sends an angel in among these 16 guards, and he's sleeping, Peter's sleeping between guards, and, and chains on and, and everything, and, and the angel just walks him out of there like nothing. And they get to the main gate of the city and it automatically opens up like you went to Scott's to shop. How amazing is that? The church is still over here earnestly praying and Peter's out here knocking on the door and they won't let him in because they think he's locked in jail. They've prayed, God released him and he's standing out there wanting in to rejoice with them and they won't let him in. But it, it, he's, he's locked in jail yet. And we talked about how we pray, prayer after prayer, and how serious are we that they, those prayers are really going to get answered. Oh, we have to pray with all our heart and all our might and, and stretch out and pray that, that almost ridiculous prayer to God and just watch him work. They were astonished when they found it did work, it says. And astonished means surprised or amazed. Why would we be surprised that our God Almighty would not answer prayer for us? 
that should be the norm. We should expect that. And then we decided, why would we pray and not believe? And that's James uh, 1, 6 through 8. I think maybe Pat has that up there. We talked about that last week. Praying and not believing that it will work. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. So if you pray a prayer and you don't think, oh, I'm not sure God's going to answer that. Or we like to add on the end of it, well, God, your will be done. That kind of covers us, don't it, a little bit. If you don't believe that that prayer will be answered by God Almighty, then you're double-minded and you're unstable in all you do. Now that's kind of a scary thought if you think that all out. Herod had bad motive. He thought it was good for him, but it was bad for others. He's in this king position. He's got all this authority and power. He can call all the Roman soldiers, anybody he wants to have anything done that he wants done, and they will do it. And he has bad motives. He's attacking the church. He's killing church leaders. God appointed apostles even. But God turned them to good because of prayer. He caused it all to twist and turn to good. God provides the way for his work. And a pure heart will always flourish. I want you to remember that. If you step out and do something for the Lord and it, it doesn't work out quite like you hoped, if you did it with a pure heart, a pure motive, God is going to take that bad and turn it to good because you love him and you're called to his purpose. There will be a good outcome eventually in all that. But Herod can't stand defeat and to look bad. So he interrogates these guards that were watching Peter and says, dudes, what's up? 16 of you in the place and you can't keep a guy locked up? And Roman law says that if you're a guard and a prisoner escapes, anything that was supposed to happen to that prisoner that escaped will happen to you. And they were going to kill Peter, so Herod ordered all 16 of those men killed because Peter escaped by the way of God and an angel. Now you talk about kind of being un unfairly treated, you could talk about that one for a while. They were obeying the king and doing what they were told to do, but boy, it caused them a, a death in the end. But God's hand prevails in evil and in good. And we need to remember that. I was thinking about that when we were singing the song this morning, the, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He's the giver and he's the taker. And it happens to all of us. And I was thinking about how we need to remember uh, Matthew seven eighteen when dealing with evil people. It says... A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Evil people have very little good come out of them. What is in them is what comes out. And that's why it's so important for all of us to be filled with the spirit and the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus. Because that's what will come out of us. Herod had nothing but evil in him and bad. And that's what he handed out to everybody around him. And I want us to take a lesson from that. Watch out who you hang out with. They might be powerful and influential, but they may drag you down. So hang out with good people, good friends, godly counsel. You know if a spirit's good or bad. And you know, a lot of us, when we got saved, I remember there were a lot of friends I had to give up because they wanted to do things that I didn't want to do anymore. So it's a choice. We have to watch out who we hang out with. 
And I wrote down hurting people hurt people, but healed people heal people. So grab a hold of somebody that's stable in all they do. They pray and believe that God will answer prayer. Hang out with them. It will rub off on you. Pride and arrogance causes us serious problems in life. And we all know that pride comes before a fall. And we're going to read in just a second that Herod was prideful. And we're going to take that lesson away from here today that pride will not cause good growth in a church or in our lives or in our family. We have to get rid of our, life, our pride. So let's read Acts 12, 19 through 25, and see where our, our scripture takes us this morning. Acts 12. Just to remember, Herod has got all these guards together and killed them. And he's really worried about the church and how powerful they're getting and how his position is threatened and how he looks. Pride will, will ruin us and it will cause us to fall. God will knock the props right out from under us if we get prideful. Herod's death. It says, Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there for a while. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Or Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. See, they got an audience. They all joined together. Herod has been having people killed. So they all grouped together. I was thinking of the church, how powerful people are when they join together. And they thought, we'll get, we'll get everybody. They, it calls it an audience here. It's like me standing up here and all of you are telling me and quarreling with me that we need peace. We need stability. See, the king had good ground and their food was raised on that ground and they needed to have a good relationship with the king. But they're starting to get scared and fearful of him, afraid they're going to lose their lives if they do something wrong. So it's amazing. It said they now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a God, not a man. <coughs> and immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. And when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Is God powerful or what? He won't tolerate a mouse, will he? He will for so long, and then he's over it. And judgment comes. And we have to keep that as a church. We have to think about all that happened and went on there. God recorded this scripture to let us know that pride is a church killer. 
Here's a prideful man, full of pride, and he's trying to kill the church to do away with it. And I was thinking how you and I get in a prideful state and how we can kill the work of God in a church with our pridefulness. There are so many churches across the land that have died just because of a pride issue. Bless God, we ain't done it that way, and we're not going to do it that way, because I said so. Scary, isn't it? And here's a man with all kinds of power that thinks he can kill the church, and everything will be hunky-dory. But how many know we got a good God, and he's not about to let that happen? Pride is arrogance. It's self-trust. It's opposite of humility. An inward emotion referring to an inflated sense of one's personal status or accomplishments. Man, that sunk into me. An inward emotion referring to an inflated sense of one's personal status or accomplishments. It was funny, Mark and I sat back there uh, yesterday morning having our God talk. We usually try to do that on Saturday morning. And we were reflecting and talking about how this thing started with some nieces and nephews at a Bible study in the library and look at what's happening now. And we were talking how easy it is to say I this or I that. When we talk about all that's going on here, and it's all God. Every bit of it. And I was telling Mark, it's, it's amazing how many pastors and different people talk to me and say, Mike, how did you do what you've done in four years? And I tell them, I don't know, dude. <laughs> this is scary. What do you mean you don't know? I said, I don't know. It's God. God had the plan. He gave me the call. It's Holy Spirit led, and I don't know how or why it works. It's amazing. But boy, Herod didn't look at it that way. That dude wanted half a city wiped out. He goes and gets enough soldiers and sits on his throne and sits there and twiddles these some till they bring back the word they're all dead. And he don't care how many Roman soldiers got killed in the process. He just sat there on the throne, twiddling these thumbs, waiting on her to happen. And you can get pretty prideful in a place like that. All I have to do is speak it, and it happens. Pride. An inflated sense of one's personal status or accomplishments. <coughs> Pride is a product of praise, independent self-reflection, or a fulfilled feeling of belonging. It's a self-reflection. We get to looking at ourselves and how cool everything is, and pretty soon our ego just gets to build it and build it into the place that we get prideful and arrogant, and then things start falling apart. The love of one's excellence. I love that, that definition. The love of one's excellence. And none of us are excellent. There's only one excellent person that's ever walked this earth, and he's sitting at the right hand of God, Jesus. Pride could also be described as disagreeing with the truth. I thought that was interesting. When we get in a prideful state, we're going against the truth of God. Who is the truth? I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. And when we get prideful, we don't need anything he did for us. And I thought that's cool. It's disagreeing with the truth. It's disagreeing with what Jesus teaches us as a body of Christ and expects from us as Christ followers. We're not to be prideful. Pride will destroy us. St. Augustine quoted, It was pride that changed angels into devils. It was humility that makes men as angels. Pretty cool. You stop and think about it. Lucifer thought he was doing pretty good sitting up there in heaven. I'm as good as God. 
and he got cast to the earth so fast it made his head spin. Joyce Myers says, Pride is an independent, me-oriented spirit. It makes people arrogant, rude, and hard to get along with. You know anybody like that? When our heart is prideful, we don't give God the credit, and we mistreat people looking down on them and thinking we deserve what we have. That's from Joyce Myers, the prophet. But there's words of wisdom there. Everything she says is true about pride. Herod and his followers were full of pride. Because of his weakness, the church became stronger. And I want us to, to pay attention in our lives. When we get around weakness, when we get around people trying to destroy us and ruin us, it's an opportunity, a chance for us to stand up for what we believe in and who we believe in and get stronger because of it. Other people's weakness can cause us to get stronger. Don't take offense from others' weaknesses. It's the bait of Satan I wrote down. We have a choice at other people's pride and arrogance and weakness to take offense and get mad at them and get in the battle with them or we can just pray for them and say, God, help them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus did that at the cross. There was an arrogance, a pride of all that people around him as he hung on the cross for them. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So don't take offense at others, but learn from it. Herod's condition caused quarreling, Scripture said. They sit there quarreling with one another. I hate that. That's, that's what a lot of committees and different things do, is cause quarreling and squabbles among God's people. Herod's condition caused quarreling. Proverbs 17, 19. It says, He who loves the quarrel loves sin. He who builds a high gate invites destruction. If you quarrel, you love sin. You're a sin lover if you're a quarreler. If any of us in here have an anger problem, an anger management problem, we love to quarrel with people, it's scary. It says we're sinning when we do that. And we need to try to curb that, to get it under control. And it's a weakness that a lot of us have, and it's hard to control. But it's important that we do it. Proverbs 20, verse 3. It is to a man's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. Fools quarrel. So don't get caught up in that quarreling mess or you become a fool as well. There are times that you don't have to be right. I'm talking to married couples here too. You know what? You need to pick your battle. Some of them are worth fighting and some of them ain't. Fools quarrel. And it takes a big man or a big woman to just be quiet and not have to be right once and let things work out. Man, there's a bunch of squirming. That's <laughs> Especially after Valentine's Day. A fool's quick to quarrel. Don't be quick to quarrel. Scripture says it's okay to get angry and be upset, but don't let sunset on that. Or it turns into a quarrel, and it gets worse and worse and worse. So we're not to sin in our anger. We're to take care of it before the sun sets. Proverbs 26, 20 says, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. Gossip causes quarrels. So two-thirds of you need to put your cell phones away and quit texting gossip.